Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, on behalf of the Reef for FNSSA project, I'm here to uh, welcome you. My name is Nur Han from the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research in Egypt. Now we can start our uh, third webinar. Uh, the webinar is under the title of Boosting Rural Job Creation and Economic Growth. Uh, the focus is tapping the full potential of the Africa-EU Research and Innovation Partnership in food, nutrition, and sustainable agriculture. Uh, but first, let me give you a brief on the REFOR FNSSA. It's a coordination and support action. The purpose uh, for the REFOR for FNSSA project is to be the catalyzer of the transformation of the FNSSA partnership into a bicontinental platform to establish a sustainable platform for the efficient implementation of the AU-EU Research and Innovation Partnership as described in the roadmap. The main actions are to support the Bureau of the AU-EU HLPD in implementing the roadmap to create strategic alliances, to strengthen the knowledge base, and to facilitate within the relevant FNSSA research and innovation networks. We have 35 partners from 23 countries, France, Netherlands, Ghana, Germany, Finland, Czech, Republic, South Africa, Denmark, Egypt, Nigeria, Hungary, Ethiopia, Spain, Sweden, Uganda, Kenya, Italy, Burkina Faso, Senegal, Austria, Greece, UK, and Portugal. About the webinar, this webinar is part of a series of raising awareness events that aim at covering the pillars of FNSSA sectors, uh, the policies aspects, the social participation, the economic landscapes, and the integrative sustainable network. Uh, we had previously two webinars, one in October 2019 and another one uh, last April. And this one uh, is the, the, the boosting rural job creation and economic growth is focusing on the economic landscapes. And we are planning a final one uh, about the synergies between the entrepreneurship, research, innovation and industry with end users. The overall objective of today's webinar is to highlight the relevance of the, of the partnership in FNSSA to support the new EU comprehensive strategy with Africa in view of the upcoming AU-EU summit, which was uh, unfortunately postponed again. The webinar will advocate for coordinated efforts for the joint initiatives of multiple stakeholders and funders to boost the African research education innovation system in order to accelerate the transformation towards green growth, job creation, capacity building, and fair market trade conditions. The agenda of today will go as follows. We have first Ms. Minka Buiman, um, which will talk about more impacts by joining forces, the role of the EU-AU R&I partnership. And then we'll have a short session for questions. Afterwards, we have Ms. Mampe Chaba um, with the topic of boosting African economy by partnering with Europe. And then another session of questions. Afterwards, we have Mr. Vincent Castell, investing in the future, how financial institutions can join hands with funders of R&I to foster economy and job creation. And last but not least, we have Mr. Edward Lehman, uh, who will talk about transforming the economy, the collaboration with R&I initiatives and the role of multi-actor platforms. And then a uh, final session of questions. So I'd like to welcome our first, our first speaker, Ms. Ninka, Head of Unit of International Cooperation, Africa, Asia, and in the Middle East, and the European Commission, uh, DG Research and Innovation. Uh, she was previously working also with DG Research and Innovation as a Deputy Head of Unit in charge of delegating the implementation of the EU R&I program to executive agencies and other funding bodies, Policy Advisor to the Deputy Director General in charge of the resources, energy and climate change research portfolios. She was also a policy officer in the International Cooperation Department in charge of the collaboration between the EU and South Africa and the African Union and the leading team and leading a team on knowledge management in the resources. So please, I would like to leave the floor now to Ms. Ninka and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, um, uh, Noan, for giving me the floor and um, good morning to everyone. I'm very happy to, uh, to be with you. I looked a little bit at the participant list. Uh, some of you um, know me, I know some of you. Um, as you've seen from my little bio, I, uh, I was actually already um, 
working as a policy officer on this FNSSA partnership. I think I was there at the basis when it all started four years ago. Uh, so I'm very happy to, um, to now uh, look at the developments, all the achievements um, that have, uh, have been reached and, and come back to you and, uh, and discuss uh, perhaps uh, its future. Um, so let me start. Um, you know that uh, the European Commission has proposed earlier this year in March um, a joint communication towards a comprehensive strategy with, uh, with Africa. Uh, this strategy is based on five partnership areas and ten actions. And uh, we were planning to discuss this strategy with um, the African Union counterparts at the summit uh, that was foreseen at the end of October. Um, to discuss this renewed partnership. The summit is now postponed um, uh, due to, to the corona crisis till the spring uh, next year, but we don't necessarily see this as a, as a negative um, uh, aspect because it gives us much more time to consolidate, consolidate at least the EU-Africa Research and Innovation part, uh, Partnership in view of this, uh, this summit. So it's the first time that there's a real visible role for research and innovation uh, in relation to, uh, to Africa. Um, it's in action five of this uh, comprehensive strategy with Africa, partner with Africa to rapidly enhance learning, knowledge and skills, research and innovation capacity, uh, particularly for women and youth, protecting and improving social rights and eradicating child uh, labor. So they're really uh, supporting the development of a knowledge um, economy uh, in Africa. And it's part of the third proposed partnership, which is called uh, Sustainable Growth and Jobs. So the research and innovation partnership between the EU and the AU is uh, mainly organized um, under the high-level policy dialogue on science, technology and innovation. This um, policy dialogue exists since 2010, but before uh, we already had a policy dialogue in this area, uh, just with a different uh, title. Um, and it serves as a platform uh, to regularly exchange on research and innovation policy on both sides. And it aims to uh, for formulate and implement uh, long-term uh, priorities to strengthen our cooperation in science, technology and innovation. So we uh, co-chair the European Commission, DG Research and Innovation co-chairs this policy dialogue uh, together with uh, the chair uh, of uh, the ST STC uh, committee in Africa, which at the moment is, uh, is Uganda. Uh, and we uh, work very closely with the African Union uh, Commission. So this year, um, uh, we had for the first time ever um, the EU-AU ministerial meeting of research and innovation ministers. It took place on the 16th of uh, July and it was very successful. We had, if I'm not mistaken, around more than 50 um, ministers or their replacements on bo both sides uh, who participated in this min virtual ministerial meeting. Um, our Commissioner Gabriel and the Commissioner on the African Union Commission side both participated in the entire uh, ministerial meeting. And the main reasons uh, really uh, was to discuss how RNI policies uh, and cooperation between Europe and Africa could help boost, um, could help in the post corona recovery. Um, so we discussed short, medium, and long term measures. Um, and um, in, in the area of, uh, of four pillars, public health, uh, green transition, innovation and technology and capacities for, uh, for science. So this uh, research and innovation partnership on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture was part of the discussion on the green uh, transition. So let me move to um, food and nutrition security and sustainable uh, agriculture as such. Um, indeed, as I already said, a very important uh, element of our discussion on the green transition, this partnership has to uh, deliver. As you po point out in your concept note, at least 65% of the continent's labor force is engaged in farming, and many of these farmers engage in uh, subsistence farming. Therefore, uh, we believe that knowledge, innovation and technology are much needed, 
and need to be adapted to the local context. So since 2016, this FNSSA uh, partnership uh, contributes with it, its, its joint research and innovation uh, activities uh, to building resilient agro-food systems um, by pursuing a 10-year roadmap, uh, you know, so this 2016 to 2026 roadmap. And the roadmap uh, has four priorities. Uh, which are sustainable in uh, intensification, agriculture and food systems for nutrition, expansion and improvement of the agricultural trade and markets, and a group of cross-cutting topics such as innovation. So for that, many research and innovation actions under uh, the European Union Research and Innovation Programme Horizon 2020 um, were initiated. Um, but also from other um, programs, such as develop, the development programs of the EU and the African Union Research Grants. Um, the example is the Leap Agri, uh, uh, examples to give uh, are this uh, Leap Agri project, but also Desira, funded from the development funding with success stories like um, Fair Sahel projects, and as I said, the uh, smaller projects of the African Union Research Grants. In total, um, total funding for this um, research and innovation partnership six, since 2016 is uh, 390 million uh, euros. And it's really, I think, what is very uh, nice about this partnership and actually all the research and innovation partnerships under this dialogue, that it's really a joint partnership where we are developing, where we develop the priorities, the roadmap uh, together, and where implementation is also done together um, financially, um, but also in terms of the researchers uh, and innovators in, involved in it and the policymakers involved in it. Um, so at our uh, ministerial meeting on the 16th of July, uh, the ministers very much appreciated this uh, FNSSA partnership. We uh, um, we showcased uh, some of the results um, and discussed uh, the different uh, investments and really urged for more international uh, cooperation between the European Union and the African um, Union. Firstly, to accelerate information gathering and exchange. Uh, secondly, to initiate target-oriented research and innovation activities. And thirdly, to reduce time to market of research and innovation activities. Um, of course, the corona crisis has put uh, research and innovation very high on the political agenda on both uh, in the European Union and African Union side, actually worldwide, and uh, which is based on policy, policies based on scientific data and advice. And uh, we believe that we've never seen such a great public interest in, in science, and we, would, we, we need and want to use this, uh, this momentum. So finally, uh, in, uh, um, in, in conclusion of my, my intervention, and this uh, FNSSA uh, partnership is really um, a flagship partnership. Uh, it's very, we see it as uh, being very well advanced with many different joint projects. Um, I particularly uh, like, I think one of, uh, of, the, of the actions done in the project was to develop a database with all the different um, projects and results uh, that are, are part of this partnership and part of, of this uh, 390 million euros that was um, invested. Uh, the FNSSA Research and Innovation Partnership is really uh, the most mature of our policy dialogue. Uh, we have others focusing on climate change and sustainable energy and uh, a third one on innovation. And of course, uh, one of the, uh, the fourth pillar is, uh, is on pu public health, where we have um, a very big program too. But the food and nutrition and sustainable um, food, um, yeah, FNSSA, it's, it's easier to say. Uh, it's really the most uh, advanced. Um, I see now two main challenges uh, for the future. Uh, firstly, we need to communicate success stories. Um, I already referred to, to this database. Often what we see is what has gone into it. Huh? The number of projects, the, the amount of money um, we have spent. But it is much more difficult to find success stories. When we were preparing for the ministerial meeting, we um, created an infographic. Uh, and it wasn't easy to actually, uh, to actually find the results. So, 
uh, I think we really, really, really need to work on this and communicate, communicate these success stories. Um, especially because the partnership, the FNSSA partnership, is, is, has quite a, a, a complex setup with many, many different uh, projects and funding coming from all kinds of, uh, of streams. Um, so with these success, success stories, we uh, can make the case for intensified research and innovation cooperation between uh, both continents. We can make the case inside uh, our institution, but also outside to the general public. So my appeal to you would be uh, come forward with these success, success stories in a very easy uh, to understand manner uh, for the public as, uh, at large. A second challenge I see is, uh, is very closely linked to the first one, but a more important. So how, uh, which is how will we be able to bring the research results uh, to the market? So this is about innovation and putting research results into practical and tailor-made applications. Um, so we see that uh, the new um, budgetary cycle in the EU um, that is uh, starting, supposed to start next year and is over seven years, gives opportunities um, through to do this through new financial uh, instruments. So I would like to ask you to please think with us and maybe think outside the box. How can the FNSSA results be part of this exercise? Um, also for this, we really need very specific examples with high innovation uh, potential. We have uh, the wish to, to develop a joint EU-Africa RNI innovation agenda, as was expressed uh, by uh, Commissioner Gabriel in the at the end of the ministerial meeting of the 16th of, of July. And this will really be a priority for us in the coming month. Um, FNSSA should be part of it because it's really a mature partnership. So my uh, appeal is let's co-create this um, agenda so as a final remark, um, you may know that um, uh, on the EU side, we're in the final stages of negotiations on uh, Horizon Europe, the future European uh, research and innovation um, pro uh, program. Trilogues, which means um, the Commission, the Council and the, and the Parliament are taking place actually um, uh, today on the, innovation, on the international cooperation uh, aspects uh, of this program. And uh, we will most likely get a deal on time. Um, unfortunately, overall budget has been reduced by the Council compared to the Commission um, proposal. The Council agreed to a total of um, 90 billion euros for Horizon Europe in current prices. And this includes 5, Euro, uh, five billion euros coming from the recovery fund. Um, so the, the Parliament wants more uh, budget, so it's still under discussion, but uh, there isn't very much uh, room for a manoeuvre. So um, we're also internally preparing uh, the first work programmes of Horizon Europe. Uh, the strategic plan is almost uh, finalised and uh, draft work programmes for the first two years are being prepared. And we expect these to be launched in, uh, in April next year. And following up on the um, ministerial meeting uh, earlier this year and EU-Africa cooperation being, prior being a priority for the current uh, Commission, we expect this first work program to have a very strong focus on, on Africa. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm happy to, um, to answer any questions if there are. Thank you. Thank you so much for this very informative session. I think you, you touched a lot of very important points that we need to consider. So maybe we can start having questions, please, for 10 minutes, because I know you're short in time, so you need to make it quick. So please, if you can use uh, the question and answers tab or just raise your hand and we can take some questions. Yes, please, Katerina. Yes, Katerina speaking, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Um, I'm uh, wondering if there's any plan for a new roadmap for the European African Partnership, uh, particularly on um, on, Leap, uh, on FNSSA, or what uh, should we expect as the content of the next work program? Should I come in or shall we wait for other questions? 
How do you? We can we can say all the questions and, and then you can finally comment on everything. So uh, we have a message from Jenny uh, that you mentioned that DGRTD would welcome support with the development of the R and I agenda. What kind of support would you like to receive from the Leap for FNSSA program? Yeah, maybe you, you can comment on both questions and then afterwards we can continue. Yep. Okay, I will I will start and I also I think there are um, um, some of my colleagues are connected as well. At least I saw uh, Marta from DG Agriculture. I don't know if Hans Jörg is uh, is connected as well, because um, they are very much involved in um, in chairing the uh, the expert group of the of the partnership and also in preparing um, the work programs for Horizon Europe. But um, indeed, uh, there is um, the, uh, the roadmap of this RNI partnership on FNSSA is now four years uh, old and um, many things has happen have happened. Uh, of course, the most important uh, is the cor uh, Corona crisis. So there is, um, there is uh, now a discussion ongoing on uh, the necessity to update this roadmap uh, next a year and so this would then be um, driven by the expert group that was um, that was put together um, working on, uh, on on getting the ideas on uh, on implementing this roadmap so they would work on, on updating this in terms of uh, what is foreseen in the first work program of horizon Europe I mean I cannot I cannot really um, make all the details uh, public but um, it will support the current roadmap of this FNSSA uh, partnership, and it will build on um, the projects um, that uh, have been funded under Horizon 2020. So we really uh, see, uh, yeah, we see the first work program of Horizon Europe as a continuation of implementing this uh, this FNSSA RNI um, partnership in the the four pillars that I mentioned earlier in my uh, in my intervention. Um, on the question of uh, of Jenny, indeed, we uh, would welcome the support. I think what um, my the point I wanted to make is that um, if we want to develop this um, innovation slash investment agenda, the most um, difficult um, uh, thing we see on the European Commission side is actually the mapping, the analysis of all the research that has already gone into this uh, on into this partnership. So um, help perhaps in, uh, in doing this, uh, this analysis, this mapping and the identification of um, success stories in the sense that uh, there are uh, maybe uh, results that uh, are, are ready to be taken up and we can take forward uh, within this uh, innovation agenda. Um, I would really see uh, um, I would really see uh, see, see, see uh, support in that area being very welcome because I'm sure that the program is doing this um, mapping and anal analysis uh, already and the monitoring uh, uh, there is this monitoring and evaluation pillar of the of the expert group as well so maybe we can look into uh, how we how we could work together on that then what I have another question. Uh, what criteria for African organizations uh, to have the potential to join the program of innovation? Um, well, this program um, does not exist yet. We need to uh, develop it. But the idea would be um, that it would be uh, implemented through, again, a combination of, um, of grants through Horizon uh, Europe and um, other type of, uh, of of instruments, financial instruments. But we are really at the beginning of uh, of our reflections, uh, not only in uh, in DG research and innovation, but uh, as a second step also in cooperation with um, the international cooperation uh, DG uh, that is working with um, financial instruments, uh, for example. Um, <clears throat> I saw. I think that the African Development Bank was on the agenda today, so uh, a discussion um, with uh, them would also be uh, very welcome. Uh, another question. Yeah, 
I just have one more question from my side. Um, what do you think, um, how can the EC bring more African states around this FNSSA partnership in your opinion? Um, yes, I think that uh, we are uh, working very closely with, um, with the African Union Commission on this. It's really uh, a joint uh, partnership. And um, at the ministerial meeting, there were many um, many, many uh, African countries actually presented at, uh, at minister level. The research ministers were around the table. I have to say there were many more uh, research ministers from Africa than there were from, uh, from Europe. I don't uh, exactly remember the divide now, but I think there were around 35, 40 different countries from Africa and uh, around 15, 20 on the, on the European side. So we are very much uh, working together uh, with the African Union Commission to get everyone around the table uh, at different levels. I mean, at minister level, um, but earlier in June we had a meeting at senior officials meeting and it was exactly, uh, exactly the, si the same. And our implementation mechanism or the body where we um, prepare these high level meetings is the Bureau. And in the Bureau, um, we have uh, several countries uh, represented from the different parts of, uh, of Africa, uh, such as South Africa, Uganda, um, Algeria, if I'm not mistaken, Namibia. Um, so we are, uh, I think it's quite, a, it's, I really uh, see this as a very inclusive uh, process on, on both sides. So if you have time, we can have one last question. So what yeah. does it mean uh, by the innovation that will be urgently required by EU-Africa cooperation focus for the co-creation of food security and nutrition support in the agenda and programs to come? <laughs> um, well, I'm not sure if I'm the one to, uh, to answer this. I think it's, uh, it's the, uh, the users uh, we would need to, uh, need to work with. But our question really is, um, what have we... Uh, I mean, we believe that this, um, I mean, we, we are quite certain this, that this partnership has um, a lot of uh, very valid research results that can, can be taken up, but we don't really know. We don't really have a very clear um, vision on this, uh, on this right now. So our uh, question to you is, um, how can together, how can we make together this um, uh, uh, more visible um, and how can we create uh, an in innovation investment agenda that is actually useful for the users, the, the farmers uh, in, uh, in Africa. And I think a, a project like, uh, like yours is much closer um, to, uh, to, to, let's say, to the, to the users than, uh, than we are in institutions like uh, the European Commission. Um, so that was really uh, an invitation to um, to, to discuss and exchange on this uh, as we are really at the start of, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of reflecting on, um, on what we want to do in the next couple of years. Okay, so I, I just want to thank you so much for your time today and for this very informative session. Um, and uh, I know you have to leave now, but thank you for spending the time to be with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, it was a pleasure. Thank you, bye. bye. So uh, now I would like to give the floor to our second speaker, Ms. Mampei Chava, the Chief Director responsible for multilateral and Africa engagements from the Department of Science and Innovation in South Africa since 2010. Her current responsibilities include strategic management of South Africa's partnerships with global multilateral and African science, technology and innovation organizations and African bilateral partnerships. She served as a director for the multilateral cooperation from 2006 to 2010 within the DST and as a deputy director in multilateral cooperation from 2004 till 2006. So I would just leave the floor to Ms. Mampei, please. Thank you very much, Nora, for that kind introduction. If you can, may you please uh, share the presentation from your site? So thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, I bring apologies from my Deputy Director General, Mr. Dan Toy, who was originally meant to present here today, 
but unfortunately had to present at our special extended exco which uh, focuses today on the budgetary cuts that we are experiencing because of the corona pandemic i think this is an issue that most african partner countries are experiencing not just africa but europe and the relevance of this topic boosting rural job creation and economic development is then fully tested uh, based on the discussions this morning. Next slide. So in my presentation, I'll just give a brief uh, introduction to the policy context within which the FNSSA operates. So I'll talk a little bit about the EU comprehensive strategy with Africa, the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program, CADA, and the STI strategy for Africa and touch on a little bit on the African Union uh, EU research and innovation partnership within the FNSSA. I'll also talk about why it's important that we have joint programming in the field of research and innovation and just give one or two examples of how the FNSSA projects are assisting us to achieve uh, the objectives that are meant to boost economic support and cooperation within our two regions. Next slide. So the EU comprehensive strategy with Africa and emphasis on the word with uh, is meant to form a basis for a comprehensive partnership between the, Union, the European Union and Africa. So it's not a comprehensive strategy for Africa by the EU, but it is a joint partnership between the European Union and the entire African continent. Uh, on the 9th of March this year, the President of the European Commission and the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy proposed the basis for a new strategy with Africa. This strategy builds on the 2018 New Alliance for Sustainable Development and Sustainable Jobs. And it also builds on existing international African and European frameworks and policies. So it, is, it supports other international frameworks such as the UN Sustainable Development Goals, Africa's EU Agenda 2063, the EU's Global Strategy, and European consensus on development and so on. It proposes five partnership uh, areas as indicated on the screen. Uh, green transition and energy access, digital transformation, sustainable growth and jobs, peace and governance, migration and mobility. The strategy sets out opportunities and challenges faced by both continents and suggest 10 action points as a basis for future action, which among others includes attracting investors by supporting African states in adopting policies and regulatory reforms that improve the business environment and investment climate, by scaling up the use of innovative financing and mechanisms. Uh, so I was on this slide where I was talking about the EU's comprehensive strategy with Africa and referring to those five pillars as indicated that are the basis for a, an EU comprehensive strategy with Africa. And as indicated, this strategy is based on an implementation plan that includes 10 action points I was just going through some of those action points that are anchored on informing and improving policy and regulatory reform in the continent. That also include ensuring access to opportunities and to markets, uh, and also ensuring an equal partnership between Europe and Africa. The European Commissioner for International Partnerships commented when this strategy was launched on the key priority focusing on youth and women uh, in responding to aspirations of this strategy. So those were the main beneficiaries over and above uh, the others that were mainly highlighted mm -hmm. in uh, uh, implementing this strategy. I will now speak a little bit about the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program, 
CADAP, which is an, a policy framework for agriculture reform and transformation in the continent. It is meant to support wealth creation, food security and nutrition and economic growth and prosperity for all. It focuses on four main pillars, sustainable land and water management, market access in particular rural infrastructure, trade related interventions, food supply and reducing hunger by increasing smallholder uh, productivity and agricultural research and systems to appropriate new technologies. Now, CADAP's main focus is meant to support, uh, to be implemented through partnerships, and hence the EU comprehensive strategy and uh, provides really a basis for how the CADAP can also be implemented through partnerships between Africa and the European continent. The STI strategy for Africa was uh, launched in 2014, and it is a foundation that helps the implementation of the Agenda 2063, which refers to the Africa that we want. And the mission of STISA is a 10-year decadal plan, if you like, that uh, supports accelerated Africa's transition to an innovation-led and knowledge-based economy. And the emphasis on innovation also links to the um, uh, ambitions of the FNSSA um, Research and Innovation Partnership. This uh, focuses on six main priority areas, educate, eradication of hunger, prevention and control of diseases, communication, protection of our space, building a sustainable society, and wealth creation. And the reason I, I'd really like to bring this to your attention is because even within the continent, the emphasis on innovation as an instrument that can bring wealth is highly emphasized and supported by all the 54 states in the continent. Uh, so the, the FNSSA partnership uh, focuses on four main areas as indicated with the goal of increasing production of high quality food with appropriate inputs, enhancing income growth and promoting rural development, but also contributing to Agenda 2030. Also supports Agenda 2063, as I've indicated, which supports uh, uh, job creation within the continent based also on science, technology and innovation. Now, the common principles of all of these strategies converges on, for, on, on the following main areas, on job creation, on wealth creation and economic growth, on prosperity for all, and on enhanced income growth, which is uh, the main topic for today. So it is quite important then that as these policies converge around these important areas, we also select projects within the FNSSA that demonstrate job growth and economic creation, economic uh, growth creation. Now, there, there has been a number of literature that supports the importance of research and innovation partnerships. Not only do we uh, reduce the cost and the risks by forming this type of partnerships, but you're also able to learn from each other as partners so that we don't reinvent the wheel. We will also to create greater efficiencies, whether these are within our own government systems or within uh, the food and agriculture value chain. Uh, these partnerships are able to offer an opportunity to maximize return on investments, to gain quick or affordable access to technologies, and to provide competitive edge through new or improved products or services within the agricultural sector. R&D collaborations facilitate the pooling of complementary skills, the pooling of complementary resources, and the pooling also of uh, experiences that have been gained over time to support this value chain. We're able through partnerships to develop innovations that otherwise could not be done by a single country or a single continent. And we also can improve the quality and efficiency 
of the innovations that have been developed. I think most important also is to ensure that we decrease the time for a product to, to leave their lab and to access markets through partnerships, we're able to see a significant decrease uh, from the time an innovation is, is, made, uh, is developed to the time it is available on the market. We're able also to expand coverage of services, whether it's government services, uh, through these new innovations that are resulting from the RI partnerships, and most importantly, also to support economic growth. So I cannot emphasize the, more the role of the partnerships, as, as indicated earlier in Nora's opening remarks, the partnership in the FNSA of F, uh, African partner countries and European partner countries is extremely important to achieve these joint goals uh, between the Europe and the African continent. I just thought I would share with you one particular example that uh, has been selected to be showcased at the upcoming um, showcasing event later this month. This is a project called Chef Line Real Gardening. It's a South African social enterprise which supports farmers in rural villages and communities within South Africa. It aims at providing or uh, manufacturing what they call biodegradable seed tapes that can be planted into the ground and they sold at farmers or families in rural communities at a subsidized fee. This project is able to equip communities with gardening knowledge and education through the partnerships that have been built with uh, the local rural uh, college and training institutions. Most importantly though, this project is able to ensure that the value remains within the township economy. So it supports township economy through a, a, a value added chain that starts both at rural communities and also meets the food and hunger need that is uh, experienced by most families, especially now during the time of COVID. South Africa and many other African countries have seen increased job losses and more and more people living below the poverty line. So expected outputs then from this initiative will include within a year, within one year, more than 50,000 homes uh, being fed through planting their own vegetables through these vegetable solutions. It will also ensure that more than 50,000 homes benefit from uh, partnerships with community colleges through joint knowledge sharing, through incubation projects, but through certified and accredited courses as well. Each of these families will have access to an early childhood development learning ap application called School in a Box, and 10,000 households can also receive this Garden in a Box kit that contains everything a family needs uh, for a year. So a family of five or four can be supported through a 250 rents uh, kit that can uh, ensure that they grow their vegetables and they're incubated and supported through neighboring colleges. I'm not going to go into the details of these other three examples, but these are examples that have been funded through the Lib Agri Initiative, which is also an EU-Africa partnership on agriculture. NutriFoods is a, an example that pr uh, provides solutions on how to increase the use of climate smart food crops. Uh, and then it produces baked products that provide nutritionally rich foods to communities that are in desperate need. It's a partnership between a number of countries from Uganda, the Netherlands, Kenya, Finland, and South Africa. Second one is also a LIB Agri funded initiative that explores opportunities and challenges for expanding local regional and international trade and market access, while also supporting supply chains uh, and exports of these uh, products outside of, of the countries that are in the partnership. BIOVA is, Afri is an African Union research grant funded initiative that recycles plant and animal biomass in crop livestock systems and aims to increase agricultural production 
of uh, products such as rice and milk by promoting innovative agroecological techniques and improving farmers' income and standards of living, but most importantly, also providing access to markets. So those are just a few examples that have been uh, funded through Lib Agri, and that will continue to be funded also from some, some will continue to be funded from the FNSSA initiative. Uh, so for countries that are still interested in benefiting from the LIB, uh, from the LIB for FNSSA initiative, as indicated by Ninke before, a, there will be a call that will be posted that will make opportunities available. And it's, it's, we have already, even from South Africa, seen the results of this partnership and would like to encourage other countries to be part of such European Union partnerships that have an impact on economic growth and boosting uh, both of our region's economic development. Thank you very much, Nora. Thank you, Mampe, so much for this uh, excellent presentation that was really, very, very easy to follow and just straight to the point. I think we already have questions, so maybe we can start taking them. Uh, so the first question is, uh, can the pay available in Rwanda? And um, then how was the pandemic affected uh, the access to agricultural markets for smallholder farmers? And what will the future be like? Um, what do we mean by eradication of hunger, hunger versus poverty eradication? I think maybe you can um, answer these ones first and then we can mm. take a few more. Mm. Now, thank you for that question. I think in South Africa, we have seen negative impacts uh, in the economy. In challenges are also observed within the agricultural sector. And that has also disturbed the food uh, supply value chain. So as a result, in trying to respond and have a, co a comprehensive post-COVID economic recovery plan, we are looking at partnerships both in the continent and outside the continent on how we can support and stabilize the economy of the continent. A number of farmers have lost their jobs, a number of um, other role players within the value chain from, from the farm to, them, to the shelf, for example, have also lost opportunities because of the lockdown restrictions imposed during the pandemic. The partnership that we've just referred to now provides some incentive, especially at grassroots level, as seen with the example that I just gave, uh, the shelf life example, where stimulation for rural economic development starts at rural communities through partnerships with community colleges, partnerships with uh, other partners in the continent and within Europe. And that is in a way uh, then starts stimulating economic growth and support without relying on government alone to provide that support. So I suspect there will be many lessons that we can learn uh, from the pandemic that uh, can support economic rural development, but most importantly also using research and innovation as a stimulus to support economic growth would be important going forward. Okay, I think we have a um, couple of more questions. Okay, so another question. KDP has been in existence for almost two decades given the six priorities of the program. Share with us how much hunger has been eradicated and how much has been achieved in terms of wealth creation. Well, thank you very much for that question. That, that's a very difficult question because we measure hunger and poverty by uh, the number of families that live below the poverty line. That's also an indicator in the Sustainable Development Goals under uh, SDG 2 that speaks to eradicating poverty and reducing hunger. So according to, to the various reports, Africa has improved its uh, poverty line by having more families outside of that $1 per 
per day survival rate. And that's how as the uh, continental indicators we have measured uh, the poverty uh, indicator. So there is still a lot more that needs to be done. And I think now during COVID, the progress that has been made in eradicating poverty has uh, been reversed somewhat because of the very many job losses that we have seen. And that's why the importance of a partnership that can help us recover will be important. But you, you're absolutely correct that within the African continent, there are still many more families that are still hungry and are affected by poverty. Uh, the next question is more or less the same about the KDP and what's impending uh, the successful implementation to boost food security and job creation. Another one is what sort of obstacles does this partnership, the Africa-EU, face? Let's I'll start with the last one regarding obstacles in the partnership. There are far more uh, opportunities and positive uh, aspects of the partnership than the negative ones. But just perhaps to highlight a few, it is clear that Europe and African partnerships usually are not balanced or equal. And that's the big challenge that we are trying to address through this partnership. The solutions that come through this partnership have to be uh, co-developed by both Europe and Africa have to speak to the challenges that the continents, both continents are facing and have to allow for access to markets and access to opportunities by both continents. So Europe's solutions cannot simply be adopted for Africa's uh, usage or utilization, but even African solutions that can support Africa's own challenges have to be supported and applied in the continent as with the examples that I've given. It's also important to note that the, the, the results of research usually take years to be achieved. So African countries need to continue investing in research and innovation to build partnerships so that we don't reinvent the wheel with partners, for an example, in Europe. And I see there's also a question from Rwanda on how it can start benefiting from just, not just the CADA program, but the FNSA partnership as well. Uh, so there are opportunities still for partner countries that are interested in benefiting to still get involved in a number of Africa-Europe uh, projects that support agricultural development. And perhaps we can share those details uh, at the end of the session. Thanks, Nora. Thank you, Mampe, so much for this very um, interesting and informative session. And thank you for being with us today. Um, I think we're on time to move to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now I would like to welcome Mr. Vincent Castel, the Feed Africa Regional Sector Manager for North Africa from the AFDB, leading a project portfolio comprising over 60 uh, operations. He has um, over the last years, nurtured the dialogue on reforms in the North Africa region to support the private sector development and inclusive growth. He previously supported the formulation of the African Development Bank's highly high level and technical response to the financial and food crisis between 2007 and 2010. In addition to developing and managing agricultural investments projects in Central and West Africa. So Mr. Vincent, please, I give you the floor now. Thank you very much, very much, everybody. I so um, I was uh, very nicely introduced by Nora. I'm going to make a presentation on how we approach uh, the uh, agriculture and agro-industry development on the continent, and then how our activities are being linked up to uh, job for use, job creation in, in in Africa, as well as research and innovation, research and development in the agriculture in the agricultural sector on the continent. Next. So, in fact, uh, the African Development Bank interventions on the continent are being structured around five priorities: light up Africa, power Africa, industrialize Africa, integrate Africa, and improve the quality of life. And our second priority is feed Africa, and this is what we are going to discuss now. N next slide. Yes, great. So 
our interventions within the Feed Africa High Priority is, has been defined around what we call four goals. The first one is to contribute to end, uh, the, uh, end uh, extreme poverty. The second one is to eliminate hunger and malnutrition. The third one is for Africa to become a net exporter of official priorities. And the fourth one is to move to the top of the key actual value chains. The reason why we selected these goals is because we believe that this is where the key challenges in the agri sector uh, lie. Indeed, as of today, we have close to half of the Africans, or 420 million Africans, living below the, body, the, the poverty line, and this number is rising. It will raise to 550 million people if we do nothing. Again, we have close to a third of the African children that are living in chronic hunger. And that, uh, that, that, uh, and that 58 million children uh, in Africa are stunned. What is also pretty much stunning is that even if there is an immense potential for African agriculture, yet the continent import bill is massive, close to 35 billion per annum, and that amount will increase to 111 billion USD by 2025 if we do nothing. And in terms of value addition to the actual produce, it's also extremely low, especially for commodities that are some of the gems of the African uh, continent, like for example, cocoa beans. If we look at the cocoa beans, what we can see is that despite the fact that Africa produce almost three quarters of the cocoa bean production, it only capture 16% of uh, the value added through, uh, through the value chain. So in order to tackle these goals, the African Development Bank is focusing in its interventions in the agri sector on seven enablers. One, we try to focus on activities that increase productivity. We focus on activities that are supporting value addition to uh, African agri uh, value chains. We focus on hard and soft infrastructure. We try to develop agricultural finance. We support the uh, improvement of the agribusiness environment. We work on inclusivity so that no one less is left out the development of these agri value chains. And also, and some of these activities today are part of this, we try to improve coordination among uh, stakeholders, both at national level and at international level. Next slide. In order to achieve this, here is how we work in terms of financing. And what we do here is very standard in the, in the IFI world, in the international finance institution world. First of all, we have a range of instruments. These range of instruments, they are, we classify them either as sovereign or non-sovereign instruments. And in addition, we have developed some advisory uh, support instruments. Sovereign instruments are basically instruments that are and financing that is being, um, uh, being backed by uh, public authorities. Uh, they have a sovereign guarantee. And here we can either support through investment operations, result-based financing, or policy-based operations. We have within the bank also non-sovereign instruments, mainly aimed at supporting the private sector. And here to the private sector and the agribusiness, we can provide debt, equity, guarantees, line of credit. In terms of advisory services, either we financing it, and that's through technical assistance fund, or sometimes, sometimes it's no financial assistance, through direct technical assistance services provided by the bank or the economic and sector work that we develop with the beneficiaries of the public sector. The African Development Bank is a group. We have different financing windows. Either we go through the African Development Bank window, and that's for the most developed, uh, the most advanced economies on the, the African continent, or we go through the African Development Fund or the Nigerian Trust Fund. And these different in instruments, I'm not going to go into uh, much details, but they have different financing terms 
and uh, that of, of course affect and is going to influence the structure of the project. Within, the, within and outside the, the African Development Bank group, we also have co-financing mechanism. Within the African Development Bank, for example, we have the GTF, that's a co-financing mechanism that we have developed with China. We also have outside the bank co-financing the mechanism developed with Quafec, uh, which is uh, Korea, the European Union, Pagoda, ACFA with Japan or the French Development Agency, among others. And to support the implementation of all these activities, we have a number of partnerships. We can mention AGRA, IFA, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations, again, among others. Next slides. In order to, I mentioned the fact that we, we have this technical assistance fund. So within the, 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 the Feed Africa program, we have some specific activities and specific uh, trust funds. And here I'm not going to mention them all, but this is how we support all the subsectors of, of the uh, agricultural and agro industry. All right, for example, we have the tax, we have the, uh, which is the, the the, the fund to support agricultural, uh, African agricultural transformation. We have the Nibble Fuse, we have the Blue Economy flagship, and later on I'm going to specifically describe two that are of interest in that conference, which are uh, a Nibble Use and the TAT initiative. Using these instruments, how do we go about uh, agricultural sector development? First, thanks to our instruments, we basically support public goods throughout the value chains. We finance our roads, irrigations, research and development, storage, in order to improve the entire agri uh, value chains. And thanks to our flagships, here we are going to support different segments of the value chains and provide specific technical assistance to, to shape uh, the project. And our overall idea is that, and, is that throughout the value chain, throughout our projects, we start integrating the private sector and we start integrating them within our projects or through specific projects that are aiming at the, the reinforcement of the private sector and the financing of the private sector. In terms of portfolio, I, throughout the continent, we have about 300 operations. Uh, for a total amount uh, of about 6.5 uh, billion uh, USD. Uh, here I'm not going to go into details, but you can see uh, for later on, you can see all the value chains that we are trying to support in the various regions of, 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 uh, of Africa. Next. Okay, here is an example of what we do when we mean by a project. What we mean by a project, that's the Uganda Agile Value Chain Development Project. So the development objective here is to contribute to poverty reduction and economic growth in Uganda, so increase productivity and marketing of agricultural produce. We have focused here with the Ugandan authorities on three commodity uh, uh, value chains, rice, maize, dairy, and beef. And here we have specific activities that are focusing either on Product, production and productivity enhancements, infrastructure development, market development and trade facilitation, and innovating financing mechanism. The cost of this project is estimated at uh, 113 million USD, uh, to which the African Development Fund, ADF, is contributing to 102 million, and the remaining is being financed by the Ugandan authorities. That was an example of investment, but uh, we also, as I said, use different types of instruments like budget support to promote policies. And that was part of our COVID-19 response. For instance, we developed a number of budget support operations aiming at improving food security in African countries to face to, to in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. For example, in Senegal, 1 million households received food kits. Uh, food in, in Djibouti, we supported food distribution to nomads and refugees. We also, through that budget support, finance inputs in Central Africa, for example. We finance capacity building in Tunisia. We supported the financing of the agro industry, for example, uh, through the financing of a line of credit in Cameroon, uh, which supported 500 enterprises. 
or we supported the agro-industry itself, like for example in Mauritius, to support SMEs. As I said here, I'm not going to focus on two of our flagships to make the connection between the Feed Africa initiative and the workshop that we have today, namely in animal use, and after that, the TAT initiative. So the Enable Use initiative is, is meant to create business opportunities and decent employment uh, uh, for young and, uh, women and men between the age of 18 and 35 along some priority actual value chains. So why did we decide to focus uh, specifically on African youth? Is because here the challenges are massive. 75% of the African population is below the age of 35, and 51%, half of the African uh, population is between the age of 15 and 35. And that segment of the population is considered to continue to grow over the next uh, years uh, in Africa, as opposed to the rest of the regions. Every year, 10 to 12 million of young Africans join the labor force. I, and however, only 3 million formal jobs are being created, resulting in about 60% of the youth in Africa being unemployed. By 2035, so which is about somehow 15 years from now, there will be more young Africans joining the labor force every year than the rest of the world combined. And 50% of the African youth are living in rural areas. So based on this, why do we focus on agribusiness? Why do we believe that agribusiness is part and parcel of the solution? First of all, it is projected that the agricultural and agribusiness sector is going to become a $1 trillion dollar industry in sub-Saharan Africa by uh, 2030. And Africa globally is the last frontier in terms of agricultural development, as half of the world's uncultivated land suitable for agriculture is in Africa. And what we have seen as well is that there is a digital transformation in Africa, allowing the, 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 the African youth to rethink the way the agri-food sector is uh, being developed. And we see that in all the competitions that we are, uh, uh, we are, we are organizing or that the other partners are, are organizing. We see now the use of mobile phone, drone, sensor, big data, solar panel, to basically rethink the way um, the, the, the agro-industry is going to be shaped. The NL use program is composed of several elements. We focus with the authorities on the enabling environment, improving the policy dialogue, changing the mindset. We basically support agribusiness incubation through training and skills development, and as well, and it's extremely important, we have noticed that in all our program, mentorship. And finally, we improve access to finance through risk sharing mechanism, capacity development, and innovative financial instruments, especially these small grants that are helping the, the startups to, and, and the youth to basically move from uh, uh, wannabe entrepreneurs to a real entrepreneurs uh, in Africa. Next. So here is what we have currently done. I'm not going into the details, but <clears throat> that was a year ago and we had already for that program mobilized about <clears throat> 334 million USD. Next. Every year, in order to nurture as well our thinking, and we believe it's extremely important to understand, the, uh, to understand the direction the, 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 the agribusiness is, is taking, we organize this African Youth Agripreneur Competition. I, that provides an opportunity for you use to show their skills, creativity. It's a two days conference workshop, but is to me, it is as important for this use than it is for us as international finance institution. Because through this competition, we can really understand 
what are the innovative ideas? What is happening on the continent? What the youth is, 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 is willing and likely to do in the years to come? Uh, next slide. So it's also for us a learning experience every year. So, for example, if I take the example of the AgriPitch 2019, here the, the, the focus of the, uh, of the conference was on climate smart agriculture. We had several partners uh, using the trust funds from as well uh, Denmark, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, uh, Quafec, SECF. We had 200 attendees to the conference. We had 25 uh, pitch. I, and what we have decided to do now is, as I was saying, as part of the mentorship, we try also as a bank to be engaged and to continue to mentor some, uh, some of our uh, winners uh, over the years. And through that mentorship, we have allowed our young entrepreneurs, for example, to attend a semi training at the Seoul National University in Korea, or to attend the technical, technical training provided by the Africa Brazil Institute, uh, among others. Next. So now, what about the TAT? And this is how we link research and development within the bank. Research and development, the, the, the research institutions, especially on the African con continent, but also the network working on Africa. And the, what we do is the, uh, with uh, the, the, uh, the Job for Use initiative. TAT, the Technical for African Agricultural Transformation, TAT, serves as a repository of technologies, expertise, and capacity transfer for the design quality. Uh, of Feed Africa projects. The, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the overall idea is through that network that we have developed with the CGIS and other technology partners, we mobilize new technologies to better shape uh, our project and transfer part of the new technologies developed to, uh, to uh, projects and research institutes in Africa. There are nine commodities that are, that are of the focus of that, which are rice, wheat, maize, sorghum, millet, beans, oren flesh, sweet potato, fish, poultry, and small ruminants. We have had through that process of mobilizing the CGRS and other research institutions, we have had a massive impact on, on our project. For example, if, if we take the wheat impact, I, we have used now uh, improved varieties, achieving, for example, four to six tons per hectare compared to before two tons per hectare. We have developed uh, heat tolerant wheat seeds, for example, uh, 65,000 tons of them in our targeted countries. Uh, in, in, in Sudan, we have increased coverage for, for wheat by uh, 300,000 hectares. Uh, 250,000 hectares in Ethiopia or, or Sudan. So thank you very much. I'll try to shorten some of the slides, but the idea was to give you some, some information so we, we, can, we can stay in touch and we, you can ask more information. And uh, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vincent. For this very deep and detailed insights on the Feed Africa program. I think this was a very informative session. And we can start taking questions for 10 minutes maybe. Where are these opportunities usually advertised and how can individuals who are not part of large organizations who run programs and initiatives on ground uh, for agricultural development and research be supported by the European African relations? Uh, another question, uh, in order to contribute for fight against underemployment and hunger, we have initiated no. a project. It's the entrepreneurship and youth employment. How can we collaborate to enable such a program? So maybe you can comment on this and then we can take, we have another one is the TAT program. Can you support solar powered irrigation and small scale irrigation technologies? Maybe you can comment on these ones. No, no, Ryan. Am I? Uh, is that a? I should respond to Mark. There is no other question, no. No, we have some questions in the question and answer tabs. Mark's question is in the chat, but it's okay. We can in the in the question and answer tabs. Most of them are asking about how the opportunities for uh, smaller scale organizations could be accessible. 
Uh, okay. Then we have Mark's question. Uh, they're looking at the FNSSA partnership and when successful research projects want to make next step to innovation commercialization, how can links be made? So I think you can answer both questions now. Okay. There, there are, there are, there are two, two. Yeah. That is, uh, that is an interesting question. There is the part on on the research and development and 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 uh, here meaning here on the non-private sector side. Uh, for research and development. And, and here I think it would be interesting for these organizations to contact me separately and to see how we can include them in our broader uh, network of uh, partners, especially for the TAT initiative and see how some of this research can be made accessible to uh, African countries and what could be the modalities for that as we have developed, for example, with the CGI partners. Uh, now there, are the, the, there is the private sector side. And for the private sector side, here again, we, it, it, the, the bank is intervening either directly or indirectly. Indirectly, we do that through our, I would say, private equity funds, and it's not necessarily obvious for, for the small enterprises. Uh, and, and as it is indirect, the only thing we can do us is to link a small entity with, with, with a private sector partner. When the entity is more mature, here we can receive a, a request for financing and we analyze it. And depending on the request, we can uh, provide support. The, the, there are two types of support. Either it's financing, real financing support to help the, uh, the, the private sector entity to grow, or we can also provide uh, technical assistance support, grant finance support to help for the to help the private sector entity to do the necessary uh, to make the necessary steps to basically submit a full proposal for financing to the bank. I don't know if I have answered the question. We have another question from Gaetano. Uh, he's asking if there is a site where the calendar of pitch events for young innovators are available. We intend to relaunch those events on the D4FNSSA website. Another question. Um, there is a high agribusiness potential in Africa, but access to credit is still a major challenge. Uh, how, um, however, your approach seems to be very high level. How can these programs trickle down to rural youth to support in agribusiness ventures? Okay, so for that question here, of course, in 15 minutes, you can, you can really pro pro provide an overall vision of what we need. But in terms of agri-financing here, the, the detail on how we link after that all the activities on the ground to the bank's financing, these details are being developed when we formulate a project. And here we really intervene at grassroots level. So in terms of financing use, we have different types of instruments. I, if we talk about at my, if we talk about at micro level, we can have, for example, we, we, we finance the uh, the banks, the micro credit entities locally. We finance uh, entrepreneur supports activities locally, and after that, things are being developed and are being cooked locally based on the local conditions. So the financing part here was really presented at, at macro level. And here, depending on what we want to do with the authorities, we develop, uh, we develop um, a specific approach uh, to, to local realities. Yes, thank you. And also, um, the, the pitch events, do you have a calendar on the website or something? So we can, on behalf of Leap for FNSSA, we can relaunch them on our website or something? Yeah, for this one, I'm going to send immediately my email address. And, um, and people who are interested, I'm going to put them in touch with uh, the person in charge of that initiative so they can be aware of the 2020 developments and also future iterations. Okay, so we have another question. Um, the AFDB doesn't seem to involve research institutions such as universities in their work. Is there a reason for this and how does the bank think it will be able to achieve the aspirations for the five pillars if research is not given priority. So this is the final question. Vincent, please, can you? 
comment on it? Okay, so then I'm go going back to what I called for, for, for the tax. That is exactly the purpose of the TAT. That is the purpose of the TAT itself. The TAT is to link up, as I was saying in my, in my, uh, in my presentation, to establish now linkages between the bank, the public institutions we are working with at governmental level, and research. I mentioned the CGIR, but there are also the national research institutions. The idea for us is to really strengthen that linkages between a research institution nationally, the international research institutions, us and the authorities. So that's exactly the purpose of this STAT program. Uh, the last question from Obi on, on, uh, on uh, tomatoes. And here that's, uh, now we are going to go into uh, with that question, some of the complex things uh, that we are doing and that mobilize all the initiatives that we are doing. And here, for instance, we have another initiative that promotes the development of agro-processing zones and rural agro-processing zones. We have implemented a number of these initiatives throughout the continent. That's something we are also discussing uh, now with, with Egypt, that we are discussing in the north, with Morocco that we are discussing with Tunisia. The overall idea here is to develop, uh, for the bank to finance uh, the development of the hard infrastructure in terms of processing zones. And these processing zones, after that, they act as a platform for young entrepreneurs and more mature entrepreneurs to develop their business, but at the same time to nearly access all facilities in terms of advisory services, uh, to improve quality or to source the products and at the same time to, to share some infrastructure for packaging in terms of logistics in order to have reliable access uh, to energy and all that at an affordable price. So that is uh, our agro processing zone initiative. I think it partly solves uh, that question and I'm happy to, to, sh to share with you a bit more information on this. Okay, thank you, Vincent, so much. And thank you for sharing your email address as well. So anyone um, who have more questions or want to ask about the funds and partnerships can approach you directly. And thank you so much for your time and, um, and this very detailed and excellent presentation. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Okay, so now we move to our final speaker that we've been waiting for. We have, uh, last but not least, Mr. Edward Lehman, the Research and Innovation Manager at uh, uh, COLEACP, -E I'm sorry, leading a large portfolio if, of projects in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean within the framework of EU-funded programs. He's part of the managing team of the European Forum on Agricultural Research for Development uh, that aims to strengthen the contribution of European agricultural research and development to poverty alleviation, food security, nutrition and sustainable development in developing countries by providing a platform for strategic dialogue and innovation partnerships between European and Southern ARD communities. Well, Mr. Edric, please, I give you the floor now. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. We can yes hear thanks, you. Nora, and for, for the introduction. Thank you for being uh, with I will us try today. To Thank you. I will try to, to share my screen. Let's see if it works. Okay, thank you very much for, for the invitation and for, for this kind introduction. Um, it's, um, I will talk today about the research and innovation initiatives and more about also example of multi-actor um, platform or um, multi-stakeholder exchanges. Uh, this is a presentation I gave a few weeks ago to FR, the, the group you, you mentioned just before. Uh, and this is to me um, a, a proof that there are more and more interest into those multi-stakeholder dialogue and more and more traction into uh, getting um, impact from those exchanges. So let me briefly introduce you why um, CoLACP was um, uh, interested into giving this talk today and how, what is our take on this. Um, CoLACP is a private sector nonprofit association. Uh, we have the objective to develop a more inclusive 
a sustainable agribusiness for ACT country. So we focus a lot on trade um, within ACP countries, but also trade with the European Union. And in the research and innovation uh, service, we are at the very interface um, in between a lot of different uh, stakeholders in order to try to find solution for uh, this objective. So whenever we want to tackle this objective, we have to focus on the full value chain approach. Uh, here is an example of the fruit and vegetable value chain, um, which is a simplified graph, but already you can see that there are a lot of different activities. So from the production, the packaging, the processing and the distribution and the marketing involving a lot of different stakeholders. So you have, for example, uh, for all the steps I mentioned, uh, the private sector, but you have also the research that will also give support for development new technology. You have the public sector that will uh, for example, provide the rule of the game with the different standard and so on. So in order to um, uh, really have um, this inclusive and sustainable business, you have to take into account all those uh, stakeholders. Uh, with our beneficiary, we have identified four main constraints for them to, uh, participate, to participate in this value chain. The first one being access to finance. The second one, access to training. How do I get the knowledge, technical knowledge, but also business? How do I build my business? I do, um, I do marketing to distribute my product. Um, collaboration and uh, coordination building. So how do I build partnerships? And also access to market. So meaning access to market, how I'll deliver my product and also how I comply with the different rules of the market. For this, uh, we have to um, identify a bit better what the markets want. Uh, in the food uh, industry, uh, the prerequisites are always competitiveness, quality, quantity, uh, consistency, and reliability. There are also rules in the game, so the regulation, the different private standard, the bio demands, which are more and more strict, and also the sustainability aspect, which is important if you want to have a long-term vision, but at the same time, if you want to uh, comply with a new initiative, for example, the EU Green Deal or the Farm to Fork strategy. Um, at Colli ACP, uh, we are not a research institution. We are not the private sector. We're not selling by, per se a technology. We are really in between. We are all playing in this multi-stakeholder landscape, the role of the innovation broker. So what is the um, brokerage in innovation? Uh, we can divide it into three points. The first one being, uh, being able to create research linkages, identify the need and the solution. Um, the second point is being able to localize and adapt. So create the enabling environment being able to tailor your solution to your local problem and um, make sure that you have the right partnership to, uh, to uh, upscale. And the last but not least point is the delivery mechanism. It is an important part in, uh, uh, in brokering innovation because you can have the best solution, the best technology if it's not delivered, if people doesn't have the skill to uh, use it, to adopt it, then it won't make an impact. Uh, let's take an example. Uh, today, uh, if we take, for example, sanitary and phytosanitary uh, issue, they are becoming more and more a barrier to the market access. Uh, for example, you have new problems such as the climate change, the resistance of the pests and the diseases. Uh, you have more and more strict regulatory framework. The buyer demands are higher. And sometimes you have lack of available and affordable solution. And this is more and more the case, uh, especially uh, in the minor crop market, for example, where, um, uh, for example, fruit and vegetables, where um, this is not uh, considered a priority and it sometimes discourages the private sector uh, to invest in research and innovation. And this is where there is most uh, need for this uh, multi-stakeholder platform and multi-stakeholder linkages so that we really foster the research and innovation activity. If we take the example of uh, Kenya uh, working on plant protection product, uh, this is an, a very interesting uh, example that we are working uh, 
uh, actually on, uh, the fruit and vegetable sector, so the producer and the exporter, um, realized that there were not enough plant protection product to protect the crops, and most of them were not suitable for export. So they decided to bring around the table the authorities. They are normally consulted to uh, register the products, but they decided to bring them early, uh, at early stage around the table in order to uh, facilitate the discussion. They also um, contacted the agrochemical industry in order to, um, to have a um, solution proposed from them, but also to uh, understand their willingness to support projects, so their willingness to distribute the product in the future. And they came up with a technical committee, which is a very mix of public and uh, private entities that have a common goal, which is ensure ensuring that the producers are provided with suitable means to protect the crops. And how uh, they decided to do this, they decided to set uh, a list of priorities where they want to work on together in order to access extension of use, which is a simplified um, approach to uh, register uh, pesticides. And with this, they want to make sure that this research and innovation initiatives uh, will have actually an impact for the producer. But if we come back at the, at the idea of the brokerage in science, uh, when they created this committee, they also had some trouble in some cases in order, first of all, um, to find some solution for some of their priorities, and at the same time also to make sure that uh, the prioritization was right. So that's where um, the broker uh, is really important uh, in research and innovation. First of all, the first step for Cole ACP was to uh, provide them support in order to define uh, the research objective, define the problem. The definition of the problem and the research objective in research and innovation is most of the time key. How you can put word, how you can formulate your problem. The second stage was to uh, bring around the table other actors. So it's again the multi actor brokerage, so the importance of all uh, the different stakeholders, they should be around the table. It could be uh, global or re local research, but as well as also, uh, in this case, international um, companies that were also working in the field of uh, biopesticides. The next step uh, to ensure that the uh, solution proposed and developed within this technical uh, committee have an impact was to make sure that the solution will be distributed and therefore you need to have a local registration. It should be locally available. And that was providing uh, support uh, to prepare the dossier and the trials on the ground. Uh, in order to, uh, to have your solution used, of course, you have to provide trainings, make sure that it's distributed and advertise in the right way so that people know uh, that it, um, it's there and can use it. And, make sure that it's solved your problem that you have in the first place. So the role here um, within this multi-stakeholder platform of the broker was to create the enabling environment, making sure that all the stakeholders are around the table, uh, facilitate the definition of the, uh, and the formulation of the research objective and the problem, um, also uh, facilitate the different um, partnerships, uh, establishment, create incentive, in some cases, uh, you need to have um, incent incentive to bring in the private sector. If we take the example of the trials, uh, it means that you need money uh, in order to build up the dossier and uh, seek a local registration. But sometimes uh, we, you would need to help your different partners to look for funds and find the right partner in order to bring this to uh, the market. And finally, of course, providing support for uh, transfer of the technology and uptake by the different uh, local uh, stakeholders. And this was also a, a very interesting success for this multi-stakeholder platform because as they uh, brought the uh, local authority at the very beginning, they were able also to uh, influence the regulation and uh, create the room for adding a new regulation on fast tracking the registration of some product. So this is really um, a teamwork uh, that is uh, giving a lot of impact in the end. So if we just summarize the, uh, the role of the broker, uh, we can go down into, uh, sorry, 
into six points, I will just try to quickly go on, uh, on like with some example of all of them. A first part is always to identify the need, help people to define the issue, which is really important in a multi-stakeholder platform where you have people speaking, let's say, different language. Some are very technical, some are not, some are very practical, and some are more maybe uh, in the high uh, level policy uh, sphere. So it's important to have someone helping formulate the problem and driving the discussion. The link with research is important. It could be a uh, link with different uh, type of research, either multi-stakeholders platforms, uh, the link for expertise and, and equipment, link with global initiative, uh, also to access technology and so on. Stimulate local innovation. This is a really important part of the broker uh, into a multi-stakeholder uh, platform. Uh, if we take the example of the COVID-19, for example, um, at Cole ACP, we try to uh, foster local innovation by providing support, uh, local support for um, information. If you have information, you will be able to react. You will be able to innovate. You will be able to conduct research. Uh, we also provide um, capacity building and support uh, in order to uh, maintain businesses, also uh, basic training on health and safety. All those uh, capacity building that will help uh, the, um, the different uh, actors to continue uh, having an activity and to continue interacting with each other. Uh, also an important point is to be able to make the link uh, with international, international standards and regulators. Uh, you have the case, for example, uh, where uh, it's important to raise the voice of certain part of the group or being able also to provide everyone with information on what's going on at different level. And of course, promotes uh, policy dialogue at public and private donors. We spoke about it with the Kenyan example and uh, facilitate public and private engagement. Um, we had um, the uh, intervention of Nyinge at the beginning uh, showing that uh, the EU is really willing to have um, example of success stories. And this is a very important role also of this multi-stakeholder platform and of the broker in between to be able to create knowledge. Uh, for example, we created uh, in our case the market study uh, with the objective to um, provide more data knowledge information on uh, opportunities where you can direct findings or also to be able to engage the private sector because they would have more information and incentive in, um, in just engaging in those activities. The role of the private sector is also important um, because uh, they will be the one actually in the end uh, supporting the, um, the rollout of the technology uh, and of all these ideas that are developed uh, within these multi-stakeholder uh, di uh, discussions. So um, they are the ones that should be driving the innovation and the uptake. They are the ones that should also invest uh, at the same time at the local level, but also at the global level, um, supporting local innovation in two different ways, uh, both uh, in technical way or equipment or uh, technical assistance, but also in finance, financing uh, those activity and making sure that they reach then the market um, in the, and, and are distributed locally. We can take, for example, um, uh, an example that we recently uh, ex experimented with Kali ACP. Um, we had a um, mango exporter importer that came to us uh, with the willingness to implement a new project on ICT for agriculture with the blockchain. Uh, their objective was to show that they were able to innovate uh, and at the same time uh, gaining marketing advantages, so um, which would mean more um, easy access to the market for the different people on the value chain. So the role here of this uh, multi-stakeholder uh, interaction and especially of the broker uh, ASCO ACP was to help them first uh, articulate their demand and expectation, uh, help them also um, identify source of fundings, uh, but also the right partner, right technical partners, and the right, right partner on the ground. 
and the idea then um, was to be able uh, as a broker to um, facilitate the dialogue between all these stakeholders so that we will be able in the end to have a project that serves all the different uh, objectives and all the different goals. But of course, around the table, you have people speaking different languages, different, uh, I mean, some are more technical, some are more in the business sector, some are more practical in the producing uh, area. So that was um, a very interesting project where the broker has to uh, really make sense of all of this in order to achieve a common goal. So as a conclusion uh, here, what I wanted to, uh, to say by this presentation is to show some example of uh, multi-stakeholder interaction. Uh, this is uh, something that always, uh, that can bring an impact, but there is an important uh, need for a driver in between that will really foster both uh, the discussion and bring all the people, the right people around the table. So it's important to be able to engage the public, the private sector, but also uh, mobilize the partnership in the long term, ensure inclusiveness, and this is the role of the broker, make sure that everybody is around the table. Uh, being part also um, as a broker of the vehicle uh, was really important to support upscaling and mainstreaming of this uh, technology, because we were there at the beginning and we were able to uh, ensure that uh, inclusiveness of the small order, especially, uh, was, taking in, was taken into account, which were in the end the one um, using the solution. Uh, the network, of course, is an important part. So that's why um, um, in intervention like LIP or LIP program like LIP for FNSSA, but others as well, like FRD, Agrinatura, and so on, are very important because they are a way to uh, bridge the gap between different groups and make sure that there is a dialogue. Um, the last part uh, that I want to emphasize on is that it was also a way with the brokerage to uh, secure private sector engagement. We spoke a lot of public sector engagement today. It's also important to make sure that in research uh, and innovation, we have uh, the, the private sector on the table. Uh, it will also, um, with this multi-stakeholder uh, activities or uh, platforms, uh, this is also uh, the center part of uh, the sustainability approach. If we take into account, for example, circular economy, it cannot be achieved uh, in isolation. You need uh, these multi-stakeholder partnerships in order to uh, develop this uh, objective that will be more and more important in the future. And last but not least, um, we need also to recognize that these um, multi-stakeholder partnerships or research partnerships are a multi-directional learning. It's not only, for example, uh, North, South, or EU, Africa, and so on. It should be in both direction. Uh, for example, we saw that the EU was willing to have more information on success story in Africa. And at the same time, the EU has a lot of knowledge that could be uh, interesting or a lot of connection within research. So we need to acknowledge that this is a multi-directional learning process and that could be, uh, that should be uh, conducted in an equitable and fair um, research partnership framework. So thank you very much for, um, for listening to this presentation and uh, I'm happy to listen to your, to your question. Well, thank you, Edward, so much. I think this was a very important presentation. Um, and it's very much similar to what we are aiming to do at the Leap for FNSA project by creating this multi-stakeholder platform that will bring everyone to the table and mobilize the, the partnership. Um, so I think now we can uh, take a few questions, please. There is already one question. Um, uh, Thank you. We have initiated a program on resilience to climate change and productivity improvement in Benin, Burkina Faso, Ivory Coast, and CDR. So how can tapping potential fall between your institution, whole ACP, and our program on climate change for Africa? Um, another question, what is your take on the EU-AU partnership in relation to research and innovation? So, 
maybe we can start by commenting on this and then we have a couple of more questions afterwards. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for those questions. Um, for um, for so basically, it's it's really interesting that you comment how we can link with Kali ACP. Basically, Kali ACP is a demand-driven organization, so we always tend to focus on what comes from the ground. So whenever you have a project, uh, you can register if um, you are eligible as a member to our organization and propose. Uh, a demand for support that will be reviewed and uh, that will then turn up into an action plan and trying to uh, develop a solution for your project or trying to um, provide you with the support you need. Uh, the support can take different forms. So it can be, for example, um, you, a need for technical assistance or a need for creating a partnership uh, in order to uh, maybe tap into the potential of, um, I don't know, it can be a local research institute, an international research institute, and so on. It can be also uh, capacity building. Uh, we do it in a lot of different forms. Uh, we uh, tend uh, always to provide training. Um, we do what we call a training of trainers so that we will enable people then to replicate and maybe through your program uh, being able to uh, convey a message or uh, build capacity further in all your area of interest. Uh, so yes, they, they are all pot potential more and more in this uh, very odd topic of climate change. So uh, you can uh, send me a, a message afterward and I'll be happy to, to look into more details in, into uh, your research project. Um, what is our take on EU partnerships uh, in relation to research and innovation? Uh, this, is, this is a very, very large question. Uh, we can discuss about it for a while. I mean, uh, it's, it's really important that uh, we uh, come all around the table in order not to reinvent the wheel. I think we always, uh, it's really important we talk about this today. Uh, we have a lot of information that are outside, but for us, the EU uh, and African partnerships is also a way as a broker to uh, find the missing part of the puzzle. So for example, if I have a project in Africa or if I have a project which is in Europe and that's, I know within one or the other uh, party that there is uh, a solution. My job will be to be to make sure that those pro people are in contact and then uh, that the dialogue is established as that we have the enabling environment so that it will turn out into action. So I would say this is a way uh, both to connect people uh, for us uh, and at the same time to uh, make sure that we have all the information available. Uh, you know, being able to have this uh, research and innovation partnership is also uh, a possibility to learn more on what is going on, where and how uh, people are tackling those and those issues. Uh, discussing about EU research will give you uh, maybe some insight of what is done there. Discussing about uh, African research will give you another uh, point of view of what is done there. And uh, being able to uh, discuss uh, together um, allowed us to be sure that we are at, um, at the same page and that we have all the information in order to orientate uh, um, research in the best way. Um, what is the next question? So it's um, basically how the private sector in Africa can be made to see value in R&I. So how to, to, how to attract the private sector to be um, more engaged and actually it's also the other way around, how to convince the public sector that the private sector is really crucial to the process. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's, 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 <laughs> that's, uh, that's a quite difficult thing to bring all the people around the table uh, on both sides. Uh, so engaging with the private sector might require you to show that there is an incentive for them. Why are you willing to uh, uh, develop uh, this uh, technology is there a market at what stage are you um, are you at the beginning is it just an idea or do you have already uh, identified partner or market to develop your solutions so 
the link with the private sector is sometimes when you are an organization, you would need also to have help, uh, you, to seek help to engage the private sector. So if we take the example that I was talking about uh, in Kenya or other where we work on uh, providing um, support to, for the registration of pesticides, biopesticides uh, for the production of fruit and veg. Sometimes the private sector uh, doesn't see an intense an incentive uh, in investing in a small market like this on minor crops. So you would need to make your case and it's important uh, to be able to show that uh, they, uh, there is an added value for them. Uh, how you create this, uh, for example, in some cases, they are not willing to invest in the first step, but they will are willing to uh, maybe distribute the product because they see uh, something interesting for them. So maybe trying to find the funds for the research will help you uh, to then bring them on because they will see that the market is already there. Um, so in the case of uh, uh, the pesticide, sometimes it's just uh, providing fundings for, uh, bring, uh, for making the, the, the registration dossier or for establishing the trials. Uh, just with these fundings, they see that uh, the first you know, step is made and now they can you know, really see the market because they will access the local registration and being able to sell their product. So it's always about finding the right incentive to bring the, the, um, the private sector around the table. And for the public sector, uh, it depends. The discussion could go on for, for a long time as well. Um, I mean, this is also uh, through this uh, large and multi-stakeholder partnership, we uh, think that it's important that they are really in, involved at the early stage. So they can also uh, provide you uh, this uh, support from the very beginning. Uh, in our case, uh, in Kenya, uh, bringing them around the table was uh, a good point because they were then able to provide support and adaptation of the regulation and the policy. So, of course, establishing the dialogue is the first step. So I think I, I have one last question from my side. Um, so this multi-stakeholder platform, you applied it to the project in Kenya and just specific projects. Um, in your opinion, what could be the challenges if we would like to expand such an approach for a bicontinental platform that, like the one that we're trying to do in the Leap for FNSSA? So what do you think would be the main challenges that we could face? Yes, well, <laughs> that's, there, there are always uh, challenges into, um, into upscaling a multi scale platform because it's nice to have everyone around the table, but it's also difficult then to keep uh, a connection with the ground and make sure that uh, it's uh, still have an impact in the end. Um, I would say, uh, I think it was, uh, we, it was uh, mentioned in the first uh, discussion, uh, focusing on, on success stories an important part of, uh, of this. Uh, really prioritize the, the, the activity where you think that they will have um, a very, that they will have um, an added value. So if you are able to uh, maybe gather through, the, there are a lot of examples now out there of local or um, regional or national multi-stakeholder uh, platform that works. Taking out this, those uh, success stories would be a good uh, first step in order to, um, let's say, uh, give the first um, list of priority on where a international uh, and larger group should focus on. In order to make sure that we are not uh, losing track, because I think sometimes in those uh, international or multi-stakeholder dialogue, we lose the point. And it's really important that uh, we keep those connections with the ground and having uh, those priority, an example of something that was uh, already working and that we can just help to upscale would be, um, or replicate would be a first way forward, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, so much for this very interesting presentation. And I think everyone in the chat is asking for your email address so they can have a, a direct contact with you to discuss more opportunities for the partnership. But thank you so much for um, giving us your um, 
this very uh, informative presentation and for sparing the time to be with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think um, now we came to the end of our webinar. I think it was a very uh, fruitful webinar in my opinion. That I would like to thank our speakers for uh, their excellent presentations. Um, and I would like to thank our attendees as well for being very interactive today. And also I would like to thank my partners um, who were behind preparing this uh, event from uh, CM, uh, IAMB and CRED, JYU and the DST and also from the University of Arnheim. I would also like to share with you our upcoming events on the REAP for FNSSA, please. And we'd be happy to invite you to, to attend um, our uh, upcoming event, uh, a virtual event as well. It's the Dialogue for Action and Brokerage in West Africa. It will take place on the 28th and 29th of October. Um, 25 young promising idea carriers were chosen. Um, this workshop will uh, expose them to investors, businessmen, and industrial communities uh, to advise and support them and engage them in the evolvement process of the ideas and projects aiming at developing the partnership of FNSSA. Please, you need to register for this event uh, on our Leap for FNSSA website. I will share the link in the chat. Uh, we also have uh, an ongoing survey that we would please ask you to take part in it. It will only take 15 minutes from you. Uh, it's under the title of Towards an Inclusive Partnership, the Crisis is Opportunities to Rethink an Unsustainable Model and Empower Engagement in R&I Africa. Uh, I will share both links with, uh, with you in the chat now. Um, and uh, I would like to thank you all for being here today and for making this event uh, successful. Thank you so much.